we are exploring the wines of South Africa. I am thrilled to be joined by Siobhan and Jim. They're going to tell us everything we need to know and some things we didn't even know we needed to know about South African wines. I think the best way to start is we, we old world and we new world all in one. And um, so South African wine has a long standing history of over 350 years, but we really are an exciting wine um, country at the moment. We've got lots of vibrant young winemakers doing some great, wonderful things in between catching a surf on their surfboard. And um, so, so I'm really excited about the wine category and what we have to offer because we can really challenge the best in the world in terms of our wines right now. I was really fortunate um, a couple, I think it was a few months ago now, to participate in a uh, a Twitter tasting and chat, and I got to learn a little bit about, I believe, didn't you do that, Jim? I did believe that. that you had led that. And so, um, I, did you have a hat on at the I, time? I, I, I forced my hat on. I know, I remember you had this, I thought we were all like hitting on you and flirting with you because you had this really cool hat on. I don't know, maybe, my, I could be wrong, but I think I remember that. Uh, oh, you did. Okay, see, I was right. You did have a hat on. See, okay, perfect. Okay, so now you got your hat on. I know who I'm talking to. When we did that Twitter tasting, I was so um, impressed to learn about the really the long history of winemaking. The story starts with when the Dutch first came to the Cape and they needed uh, basically grapes or wine to supplement the vitamin C on their ships. And so the industry was born. My in-laws went to South Africa a couple years ago, and they just loved it. They're still talking about this trip to South Africa. I imagine you get a lot of folks um, like my in-laws who maybe didn't know that much about the wine, but then went there, loved the people, toured the wine regions, and came back with these fantastic stories to tell. We have incredible wine tourist offerings. You can, you can go to the winery, you can experience fantastic wines, you can have fantastic food with your wines, you can stay over, and in most cases, there's entertainment as well. So we have this, this all-encompassing package, if you want to say. And you can travel within a few kilometers and have old world style, homely food, great entertainment that really is uh, traditional. And then the next minute you go off and you find a, a more modern style of winery with more modern offerings, sort of modern expression of our winemaking. So it really creates a, a, a memorable experience um, with great weather, great scenery and lots to do. All I was going to say, well, like a giraffe is just kind of walking by, uh, you're sharing a sip with a zebra. I mean, none of that's happening. No, <laughs> I, do, I don't have a line. I don't have a line from our back garden. Sorry. Well, you can, you can sip a Pinot <laughs> Noir and watch whales from land. It's the best uh, best whale watching uh, from sign, land. For, uh, yeah, sign me up. And thank you for the segue, Jim. Let's talk about some of the varietals that they produce in South Africa. Okay. Well, um, one of the things that's really exciting is it's it's quite uh, varied and diverse in, in the offerings. Um there's uh, the Cabernet is the most planted red, there's Merlot, there's Pinot Noir, uh, there's Pinotage, which we can talk about, and on the white side you have Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay, and then our most planted variety, Chenin Blanc. So it really has a lot to offer, lots of uh, many different tastes as far as wine goes. And talk a little bit about Chenin Blanc, the history there and why it is so popular. Well, um, it's, it's about 18% of the plantings, which means there's more Chenin Blanc in South Africa than the rest of the world combined. And it's, uh, well, originally it was, it was planted both for winemaking but also for brandy production. And one thing that the South Africans like is that it keeps its freshness even when you grow it in a warm climate, like some of our, like Stellenbosch or Swartland, some of our uh, warmer regions. And it creates um, a wine that can have a, lot, a wide range of expressions. But what we see now is kind of a median style that's great because it has enough body for Chardonnay drinkers. It's got freshness that a Pinot Grigio uh, drinker would enjoy, and then it has this aromatic generosity that a Sauvignon Blanc drinker would like. So you can really, like, at a party, you can put that out, and it's going to have something for all your friends, and they're all going to find something they enjoy in it. And talk to me a little bit about Pinotage, because I can't tell you how many times I've opened up a bottle of Pinotage, and my husband still says to me, what is Pinotage? I'm like, I told you last week. I told you the week before. <laughs> like, why isn't this sticking? Like, so talk to us about Pinotage. What is Pinotage, Jim? Pinotage is the love child of Pinot Noir and Cinso. And Cinso was grown because it's, it's quite disease resistant and, and suited South Africa. And a Pinot Noir, you know, a lot of uh, people in the, in, in the wine world and now very broadly love Pinot Noir. So back in the 1920s, they were crossed. And um, at the time, Cinso was known locally as Hermitage. So Pinot Noir plus Hermitage yields Pinotage. That happened in Stellenbosch. So it's a uniquely South African cross. One of the things it picked up from its parent, Pinot Noir, is it can be a finicky grape, so it has a little bit of a mixed reputation, but now we find that the winemakers who are specializing in it are really serious about it. And like Pinot Noir, when you give it the attention and you grow it in the right place, you can get really wonderful wines from it. 
I was fortunate enough to try one of them along with some of the other wines that you sent, a uh, Sauvignon Blanc as well as a uh, sparkling rosé. Talk a little bit about the red blends and then some of the other wines that uh, we tried. So we tasted the uh, Warwick Cape blend called Three Cape Ladies. And um, a Cape blend is kind of a category that the industry um, created to kind of embrace Pinot Tauge and put it in that blending context that I was talking about. So usually it's 30 to 70 percent Pinot Tauge with other varieties. If I remember correctly, it's uh, Pinot Tauge, Cabernet, Merlot, and Syrah is the, are the four grapes in it. Tell us about the sparkling category, because I'm not sure that's something that people think about when they think about South African wines. It, it's, it's funny that they don't, because it's um, growing dramatically here in the States. Uh, I think it was up about 50% last year of what the, the South African sparkling category. And South Africa is the first New World country to create an official designation for wines that are made in the traditional champagne method that doesn't use the word champagne. So what we call them is Method Cap Classique, or more informally, MCC. And um, it's got very much the same rules about a secondary fermentation in the bottle and then resting on the leaves to create that, that wonderful texture that we love in, in champagne and other uh, traditional method sparklings. Something about South African wines or the region that people don't know that you think that they should know. I think for me, it's, it's the realization South Africa is making some really world-class wines that can stand up to the best in the world. When people say that South African wines are good value, it doesn't just mean you should buy a cheap one because it's going to yeah. taste pretty good. It's that we over-deliver at all sorts of price points. If you need a good value vino that over-delivers, we now know where to go. So thank you both so much.